Happy Sabbath, everybody. Keep it down, Zork. You're listening to Word SBC 88.3 FM. Hey, PowerPointers, what's up? It's your favorite uncle, Uncle PJ, with another PowerPoint for today. And here it is. It says, God uses events in our lives to turn our hearts to him. Let me tell you something. Quick story. Real story. You know, sometimes we think that as once you give your heart to Christ, that, you know, everything is smooth sailing. You could do whatever. You have an advocate with the Father. That's the one phrase I always used to kill. But guess what? That's not used in its right context, if you're not careful with it. So, I did something over and over, which was not right in God's sight. And guess what? That one time, God caused me to fall flat on my face. And one of my favorite pastors once said, Sometimes God allows us to fall flat on our face in order for us to look up. And that was one of the most powerful things I could always remember. So guess what? Whenever we face these trials, these sins that so easily beset us and we try to keep getting, going through them over and over and over, sometimes we need to always remember that God can turn it around and make it right. But all we have to do is go to Him. And guess what? Once we go to the rock, the rock does not always have to be up. Sometimes even when we fall, always remember at the bottom, God is still the rock. So don't you forget it. Once again, it's your favorite uncle, Uncle PJ, with another PowerPoint for today. God bless you. Why Christian is Smiling The low throb of a small engine sounded overhead. Eight-year-old Christian squinted his eyes as he looked up to catch his first glimpse of the plane in the Papua New Guinean sky. Papa, is that it? Yes, son, that's the Mission Aviation Fellowship plane that will take us to our mission outpost. The plane circled around the small runway at the Daru Airport one last time and then landed and taxied up to where Christian and his family were waiting. Hello there, came the friendly voice of the pilot as he walked up to greet everyone. We need get going quickly. There's a storm heading this way, and we don't want to get caught in it. Christian grabbed his backpack. He'd flown on big planes before, but this was the smallest one he'd ever been on. The door's on the other side, said the pilot. Go ahead, and get in. Christian walked around the plane, looking at the big propeller at the front and the three small wheels underneath it. Then he and his two sisters climbed in. Once inside the plane, he found a seat in the front, next to a window, and right behind the pilot. The perfect spot. The engine started, and Christian and his family bumped down the runway. Before he knew it, they were in the sky. Looking out the window, all Christian could see were trees, trees, and more trees. Are there any people down there, he thought. I don't see any houses or streets or neighborhoods like in America. Soon, the mission plane circled a small grass airstrip in the middle of the trees. With a bump, it landed and quickly came to a stop at the end of the runway. Christian picked up his backpack and followed the others down a path to a river, where he saw a fiberglass boat with the mission logo on the side. Once all the family's bags were loaded up, the engine started, and they were on their way down the river, going fast. There was so much to see. There were egrets gracefully flying by, people paddling in long, dugout canoes, children on the shore waving, and beautiful trees. The people wore different clothes than Christian had seen in America. But that didn't matter. They seemed very friendly as they smiled and waved. He liked this new place. Look. Papa said. There's the mission outpost. That's our new home. The dingy followed a bend in the river, and the motor slowed down. On the bank, people stood waving, with happy smiles on their faces. The dingy pulled over to them. When the engine stopped, Christian heard them singing, We are happy today, we are happy today, we are happy to have you here. He couldn't stop smiling. As soon as the song ended, he was the first to climb out of the dingy. Walking down the long, long line of waiting people, 
He shook hands with each one of them, taking notice of the large number of kids. He knew that he was going to like his new home. Thank you for your mission offering that helps spread the gospel in Papua New Guinea and around the world. Hello, PowerPointers, and welcome back to another episode of PowerPoint Sabbath School with Friends. This week's lesson is Lesson 2, and the title is First Fire, Then Rain. Our power text is taken from 1 Kings 18, verse 37, and it reads, Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Our PowerPoint is, God uses events in our lives to turn our hearts to him. Before we get into our summary, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this program. We pray that it blesses the people who are watching. Dear God, may it uplift you. And may this program go really well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let us look at our Bible lesson at a glance. God sent Elijah to meet with King Ahab. Elijah calls for a gathering of the people of Israel together on Mount Carmel with the false prophets of Baal and Asherah. They are, set, they are to set up an altar of sacrifice and pray to their God to send down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. The God who answers by fire is the true God. The prophets of Baal and of Asherah jump and shout and even cut themselves. But to no avail, no fire comes from heaven. Elijah gathers the people of Israel, Israel around the altar and prays to the Lord, asking him to show his mighty power. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes the entire sacrifice and altar. This is a lesson about grace. God, through his grace, uses the circumstances of our lives to turn our hearts to him. On the program today is my beautiful co-hostess, Marcia Vienami. We also have as guests on the program, 
We have jo Joshua Channer and also Nathaniel Adderley. Thank you guys so much for joining Marcia and I on the program today. Now let us get into our questions. So our very first question for this week's lesson is, what things distract our attention and causes us to waver in our decision to follow God? Go ahead, Nathaniel. Be honest, it's kind of school. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not gonna say I love school. That's not true. But I like getting good grades. But then sometimes, like, overtakes me, and I'm like, oh, we gotta do this. Oh, get read my Bible later. And then I realize, huh, this isn't right. I should have got all my time, but still get good grades out. And so I made a neutral balance kind of you could say but i'm not gonna lie I don't, my balance still has like 40 minutes bible and 60 minutes academic that might not be the best but that's what i can work out so far um i agree with nathaniel Concerning that, I believe we should have a balance. Um, one thing that can interrupt us is secular activities. For example, video games. See, all, all those things like Fortnite, Roblox, all those different games. And they sometimes they can prevent you from hearing the voice of God as well. Because when you do all these secular activities, you shut yourself away from God's voice to some extent. So... That's one thing that can be used, that, that the devil uses actually to disrupt us in our walk with God. Everyone, and they say that this Proverbs 11, verse 1 says, A uh, fall balance is an abomination to, to the Lord, but a just weight is, a, is his delight. I know sometimes it can be like the environment. And I really think that the people of Israel between God and the whole environment was changed as you know, Israel they're God's people, they worship God, but then there's um King Ahab and his forefathers, they came and they introduced idol worshiping. So I guess women caused them to waver between God. And like you said, your entertainment, sometimes you can be so um, consumed into what you're doing that you forget about God. And then you you waver between if I'm for God or if I'm against God. And James, James 1, 6 to 8 says, But let him act in faith, nothing wavering. But he that wavereth is the wave. It's like a wave of the sea, drive it with the wind and toss. But let not the man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So I'm suggesting in us that wavering is not good, so we should choose God and not the other. We should choose one or not the other, because the Bible says a man cannot have two masters. Thank you all for your answers. Um, I agree with what, all, what all of you are saying, and I think some things that distract our attention, as Joshua was saying, in general, secular activities, and I think sometimes, like, even the music that we listen to can, avoid, like, block out God's voice, God's word, and I don't think that ever feeds your spirit, um, in general, just like not waking up in the morning and not doing, going through your Bible and worshiping and taking time out of your day to um, allow God to speak to you can waver your like your following of Jesus and it almost takes you off the path. But I think a lot there are a lot of distractions out there. For example, our phones are a huge distraction. Um, just going on your phone to go look at social media is just toxic in a way, at least to your relationship with God, because you never know what's going to show up on your For You page that is going to probably like move you away or move you 
it's not making you closer to God, so it's bringing you farther away from him. Anything can show up, whether it's like a bunch of cursing and whatever like that, some music that you listen to. And I also, when I had TikTok, I found myself, like, I would go, like, on my 40 page, scrolling, 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 hours, literally. And I would find myself, I don't, I didn't pay heed to the, like, the words of the song. But I found myself humming and whatever and, and singing the songs. And it's like, that's not bringing you closer to God. That's not feeding your spirit. So I think those are some distractions that bring us like less, it doesn't carry us closer to God. So our second question is, talk about what is the most amazing and miraculous part of this story to you? What is the most amazing or miraculous part of this story to you? Go ahead, Nathaniel. Well, how King and how Ben thought like, oh, we're gonna make fire rain thanks to Baal and then, and then nothing happened. And then Elijah is like, you fools. God is the only God. And then he starts praying. And then the miraculous thing is that he ordered his servants to pour water on the altar to start a fire. The thing that got me was like, what? Uh, shouldn't like a fireplace be like nice and dry and you just want to soak it up to make fire? Then he started praying. And then leashes, fire, fire, hot fire, hot fire from heaven. And it just goes on the altar like, bam! Man, King Ahab should have been so shame after that. I was like, I should have known. God's the only God. Baal is not real. I really do wonder if he, like, changed his ways after that. But the Bible doesn't say. At least I think not. Um, I agree with Nathaniel in terms of what's miraculous part of the story. Um, for me, the most interesting part was the part that Elijah, right before, right, the first words that he said to the people, I think, was, which one will you serve, Baal or the Lord? If the Lord God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. And that brings me back to two verses. Um. The one verse is in Joshua. It talks about, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it brings me to another verse that I think we mentioned before, saying nobody can serve two masters. So I think that in that specific part of the story, it just shows how everything connects. And it also shows how the Bible is also connecting. The Bible stands up. Each chapter stands for another chapter. And it's just proof of how God, there are many books that could have been put in the Bible, but God still chose some books. And I really think that that's a very interesting part of the story for me, as it expands to more than just the story, it expands to the whole Bible itself. I totally, I totally agree. And like everyone saying the fire i just am amazed at how the fire it consumed the wood it consumed the meat it consumed the trench that was there all the water and i was just so amazed that oh god didn't just send the fire and then just lift up the meat i think it was kind of it could represent maybe god kind of how his people um they didn't believe in him and they didn't worship him, but they chose to worship idols after all he'd done. But I also, one thing that really stuck out to me when um, Elijah was praying, he said, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. I really thank God, and it shows how God humble, to me it shows how God, he is very humble and patient because it says that he will turn our hearts back to him. We are so low and below God that he's still coming here to woo us to turn back to him after all that we've done. We're just mere people he just made who keep on making him mad, keep on turning against him, keep on doing things 
that are not of him on um, what his Bible says do. But here is um, um, the prophet Elijah is asking to allow him or to show himself so that he can turn their hearts back to them. And I just feel it really showed me how I think how humble this he is and how God he really gives us the freedom of choice because he just didn't say, Oh, you must turn back to me. Because there's like a lot of instances in the Bible where Israel they really turned against God and he's still coming back, wooing and saying that he'll turn their hearts again to them. That's what is amazing. I love all of your answers. I think the most amazing or miraculous part of this entire story to me that stood out to me was like um, 1 Kings 18 and verse 39 says, now when all the people saw like the fire, um, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And I, and later on in verse 40, they talk about how Elijah sees the prophets of Baal. But um, in that verse, I think it just shows that, honestly, I, the Israelites already knew. Then again, I cannot say that because I was like a new generation of Israelites over time and time again. So over time, you know, they worshipped um, different idols and they were seeking for this fulfillment from this God. So I don't think they really knew the one true God as the, um, I believe, like I would say, the, the Israelites from Moses' time. I don't think they really knew God the way that those Israelites did. And over time, they just lost, each generation, I feel, just lost touch with God. And this story just showed, or this, the fire, the miracle, um, the fire coming down from heaven, like, almost immediately after Elijah prayed um that just showed that they it was almost like a confirmation for them that God was really the one and true God and I feel like it shouldn't have come to that honestly but it did because Ahab was their leader and was encouraging this foolishness this idolatry and so they chimed in and now that they realized that God was the one true God it just showed that they came down and was like, okay, no longer can we worship Baal because now we see that this is the real stuff, the real deal. So that was, I think, in all, just the whole fire coming down from heaven, like, immediately was just so... I could just imagine being there. That would be crazy. But, um, yeah, I think that was the most miraculous part seeing or, hear, or reading how the Israelites came down and just realized that God was the one true God. Finally, they realized. So third question, was there a time, oh, my bad. What does this story teach to you about worship? What does this story teach you about worship? Go ahead, Nathaniel. Well, it taught me how God is the only true God. And people are like, oh, oh, hey, Nathaniel, do you want to come worship this rock with us? And I'll be like, um, no, there's a God in heaven up above, and that's just a rock. And just let you know, the God in heaven made that rock, so, um, throw it away. It's dirty, you might get germs. Yeah. What I think this teaches about worship, um, if you think, if you look at through First Kings, God, God could have punished the Israelites straight up. Once, once it, once the two broke apart from and turned into Israel and Judah, God could have punished them straight up. But God, the Bible says, God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. So God gave them chances, 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 and then people think, oh, this this king, he does something, he does one thing bad, and then a whole three years of famine, God gave them chances. And same thing with us. God gives us chances. Even if we are going through struggles, even if we're going through heartaches, and we slip away, God gives us chances, and God always wants us to come back to him, whatever, no matter what happens.
what um it teaches me about worship is I think that's like the specific type of worship that God will ex um, accept or allow because the prophets, when they were worshiping and calling out to Baal, they went to extreme where they cut themselves and they were so exhausted. And while worshiping God, he wanted to worship him wholeheartedly and also enjoy it at the same time. He doesn't want us to be... He didn't want to come off as a stern God, even though God, he is quite stern, but he's also loving. So I don't, I think it just shows that while worshiping the, the, the prophets worshiping and pleading for the idol, they just, they keep on hurting themselves um, while Elijah he just prayed to God to show himself, and he said that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all the things at thy word. And that's right, showing that he's actually, he was willing to do that, and he wholeheartedly did that, and he wholeheartedly wants the Israelites to know that he is the one true God, and so I just show that there's some type of worship that God accepts because while they were worshiping the idols, they kept on hurting themselves. But while we worship God, even when we deter and waver from him, he still wants, he wants us to do it out of our heart wholeheartedly. I love your answers. Thank you guys for your answers. Um, I think what this lesson teaches us about worship is just that I feel like honestly, I just think my worship, I, what I got from this lesson is that I just think the cutting of themselves and all of that was, I mean, too much. And I mean, in general, worship shouldn't be about self what is it self-hurt or whatever so i realized that god is not about that and he just wants us to come to him and this is what i got i just think that the prophets of baal didn't didn't really understand that god i don't think they even knew they don't they didn't knew god they didn't know god because what they were doing was not of god and I just think worshiping, you have to be careful who you worship and why you worship what you worship. And I worship God because he has done so much for me in my life. And I know why, and I know who God is. But we sometimes don't even find ourselves worshiping um, our idols, like our phones and what's not. Instead of us worshiping God, we spend like all of our times on our phones or during during doing certain activities other than um, to um, worshiping God. And the Bible says like every decision is an act of worship. So any decision that you make, you have to make sure that it's well-rounded about God because that is who you're supposed to be worshiping. And that answer is kind of all over the place, but that's what I got from the lesson. Go ahead, Nashia. I'm speaking more about it. Um, I'm now thinking, I'm thinking maybe they didn't really know the true meaning of worship. Because, you know, usually, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, when we go to church and we're worshiping God, we don't chant, we don't run around, we don't shout. I mean, I mean, they, there may be a moment where we're calling out to God, pleading, but we don't shout, we don't run around, run around. It's quite reverent and quite serene. And we in with that when our worship within our worship, we also have a time we pray, we review the Bible, we sing. But we noticed that while Elijah was worshiping God, he first prayed to God. But when the prophets were calling out to God, they said, Harris, Harris, and cutting themselves, but that's not how God wants us to worship him. It's everything while worshiping is quite reverent. That's the answer I think. Yes, I agree with Marcy. I just think that 
that sums up basically my answer kind of like uh that is not what God wants. I don't think he wants any of that. I mean, I know he doesn't because you know, the Bible talks about making, causing, inflicting harm upon yourself. Like the story goes into talking about how they cut themselves till they were weak and exhausted. They didn't know what else to do. Like, and that is not like, I feel like the ho- all the hollering and all that, even up to now, I, we just worship God and re- worship is of um with is it deity or reverence or something like that it's supposed to be something of um showing respect and what's not i do not think any of that was respectful but anyway let's moving on our yes that is our last question coming up next is our last question um the question is was there ever was there a time when god answered your prayers and if you'd like to, please share. Um, was there a time when God answered your prayers? Okay, so I remember when we were having community service day and it was raining. And I think this was around the time that there was a hurricane around the Caribbean this year. And I was saying to the Lord, Lord, you know that this would be my second, I believe, my second community service going out into community. And I have been in the community. They need my my community especially is... I wouldn't say it's a poor community, but they live a hard life. They they go through a lot just to feed their family. And I'm saying, Lord, you know that this is your mission. This is the one of the ways that we do mission, ways that we use outreach by helping persons need. This is the way that you used in your outreach. Lord, if you want this to happen, please allow the rain to stop because we were uh, because we weren't really going to go out in the rain because we weren't prepared for that and if you and since it was a hurricane if there's rain there's a lot of wind as well and we didn't want to risk it so we say lord you know that you want us to go let us go and the rain stopped about 15 minutes before the time we that was allotted to go out so I thank the Lord for that. And just to see the joy on people's faces, giving them tracks, giving them resources, it just felt joy to my heart. And then seeing them getting baptized it just adds to that as well. I'll go next. Um, firstly, God, he always answers my prayer like, I mean, there's some things that he won't allow you because it's just not our time or it's not something right for us. But honestly, God, he, and he always answers my prayer, which is very wonderful. And I was really blown away. Sometimes I doubt that it was actually my prayer. I mean, it was my prayer, but I doubt that God actually did it, me, did it for me. So my brother is one. So four years ago, I remember, and as you all know, I'm the only girl. So four years ago, I was in the shower, sorry, TMI, but, and I just prayed to God, Lord, please allow me to have a baby sister. I just want a baby sister. And then a couple months later, I found out that my mother was with child, but it wasn't a baby, (laughs) a baby girl. It was a baby girl. But still, I ended up having another sibling. And Miles, it was kind of like having a baby sister because my he did have hair. He was so sweet and loving. He gives you kisses and everything. So that was like one of the main things where I said God really answers my prayer. Even though he didn't give me a baby sister, he I kind of think with Miles, because he's different from my other brothers, he gave me what it feels like. To 
Ms. Anna, do you have anything to add? Nothing? All right. Um, thank you guys for your story. Uh, God has answered my prayer so many times. But one time that I can really remember was, I believe, when was, what, which month is the month of Easter in? Is it April? It's April? Okay, good, good, good. All right. So it was the month of April, and I was traveling a lot that month. Mind you, there was school. I went to, uh, I went, I tra traveled for the Easter break. Then after that, my godmother had died that in during Easter break, and I had to go back to that same place again. I had to travel again for, on a school day for my godmother's funeral. At my godmother's funeral, my mom had caught COVID and then she was really sick and I did not know that she had COVID at the time. And I remember that day, that was like a Monday, we had just came back and it was a Monday and she was feeling really sick that Sunday. And so she didn't go to work and that's not like my mom. And I went to school and I started to cough a little. I didn't know I had, I didn't think it was anything, just a little cough, um, like, a, like a clang of my throat. And um, my principal came and escorted me out of school and my mom had actually had was tested and said she had COVID. Then literally like the next day I was sick, like really sick. COVID is not a joke, bedridden, like it was really bad. And I was praying to God and mind you, I love food and I was not eating, I wasn't talking, I wasn't going anywhere, moving, none of that. I was really sick and I had COVID and I prayed to God that he would heal my mother and I. I wasn't really worried about myself. I was worried about my mommy because then again, I'm a teenager. She's older than me, obviously. So she is more, I feel like she's more at risk because she's older than me. So I just was praying to God that God will allow her to be okay. Because Sunday, nothing was wrong with me and I was taking care of her and I was so like, I, like, I started to feel so emotional because I was like, why is she sick? And I don't know why she's sick. And I am thinking something's going to happen to her because she's, like, coughing like crazy. She's, hurt, like, hurting in pain. And I don't know what's going on, and I can't help her. So I was asking God to really, like, heal her and heal myself when I realized I had COVID. And he allowed me to come out because I'm here today. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that. And he saved my family from that wretched disease but um a verse that came to mind just now um first john 5 verse 15 and it says and if we know that he hears us whatever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him so basically in general that just means that if we know that he hears us and what we ask for we know that um he will provide it for us. I know, I know many times we pray for stuff and it does not come in the way that we would like or in the time that we would like. We always have to remember that God's timing is always the right timing. So we always have to remember that his way is the best way he's looking out for us. And say a family member is sick and they might die, but it's not about them dying, but you want to know that they're, they died in Christ or that they didn't die in pain, that they had the best hours of their life at the end, you know, just making sure that that person is okay. And at any problem at all, praying to God is our way of communicating to him. And we know that he's going to answer our prayers, but just have to remember it is in his timing and he's never, ever late. So that is a testimony right there. Thank you guys so much for all of your testimonies as well. And I see you. Yes, your brother is a little um, answer from God. Yes, and Joshua, that is awesome that so many people got baptized and you were able to um, be a missionary for God. That's awesome. So thank you guys so much for your answers. Uh, that is the end. Unfortunately, you're done. But do not forget the PowerPointers. Um, we have so much more coming up next. We have Uncle, oh, oh my gosh, Pastor DJ with our 28 grades and lesson recap. So we're looking forward to that. 
uh, we are talking to Karen Stacy Tweet. And I'm so happy that she's back. So elated that she is back. Um, we know that this is the month of October. Uh, and for the month of October, she's making soups. And I love soup. And last week, she made a cheesy broccoli soup. And that looked delicious. I love anything down from um, cream of mushroom, anything down that doesn't have anything that I cannot eat. So I love soup. And I'm very excited to see what she has for us this week. So thank you, Princess Sakel. And we're very excited to see what you have for us. We also want to say thank you to Uncle PJ. Last week, he was not there to give us our PowerPoint recap. But I'm pretty sure this week he will be here. So we're looking forward to that. Also looking forward to our special feature. So that comes at the end. So stay tuned for that as well. Also, if you have not already, please, please visit kidscomproduce.org. Once again, kidscomproduce.org. We are on there as well as a great Christian program. So please check that out any time of the week, any time of the day. So please check that website out. It is now time for our subscriber count. And I am so, I'm gonna cry. It's so beautiful. Um, we're very close to 800. We are at 796 subscribers. <laughs> So that is awesome. Uh, so we reach 800. <sighs> it almost feels surreal. It's awesome that it's um, 796 of you guys watching us um, and subscribe to our channel. So thank you guys so much for all of your love and support. And if you have not subscribed already, Please subscribe because, you know, that's the best thing you can do other than following Jesus. So please subscribe to the channel. Please like. Uh, please watch to the end. Please share with a friend. And um, that is about it. But I would like to say thank you to Joshua and Nathaniel for being on the program with us today. Much love to both of you. Thank you so, so very much. And thank you, Marcia, for joining me on the program today. Much love to you as well. And much love to all of our viewers and PowerPointers. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, before we close, can Daniel please pray for us? Yes, I will. All right. Then I got thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all here. Thank you for our subscriber count. Oh my goodness, it's unbelievable. But thank you for letting us reach out to someone, help us to make someone say better, help us to teach everyone the Bible. It's the first thing we met. Amen. Thank you so much, Nathaniel, for that prayer. Once again, thank you, Joshua, and thank you, Nathaniel, and Marcia as well. Thank you, PowerPointers. Thank you, everyone. Um, not forget that Jesus loves you and we love you all as well. And we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Did you know that Jesus Christ was not the last prophet? Hello, my partners. This is Pastor DJ with What We Believe. Fundamental belief number 18 speaks of the gift of prophecy. We believe as Seventh-day Adventists that God raised a prophet, yeah, prophet, to communicate to his people. Like in the lesson, we see that God used Elijah. To speak to his people, to warn them from sin, and to lead them in the right direction. We also believe that God has used Ellen G. White in a mighty way when he when she wrote almost two thousand she when she had rather almost two thousand vision and dreams. And so today let us trust the prophetic writing of Elenjerite. Let us believe also 
that prophecy is one of the mark of the remnant church of the church of god may god bless you and have a happy sabbath one of my favorite grab and go meals is noodles so of course our month of soups would not be complete without it today we'll be making chicken noodle soup let's get started our ingredients for today include egg noodles, chicken breast, celery, onions, carrots, olive oil, garlic, salt, basil, parsley, thyme, a bay leaf, and water. You will also be needing a spoon and a Dutch oven. Add your onions, garlic, and oil in your pot on medium heat and cook for about 5 minutes. Add your celery and carrots and cook for a few more minutes. Add your chicken seasonings and water. Cover and let simmer for one hour. Remove your chicken from your pot and shred it. Add your noodles to your pot and boil until tender. Return your shredded chicken to your pot, check your seasonings and serve. Have you ever been sent on a mission? I have. Like Paul and Titus, we must be willing to go on missions to help others because when we do, we serve God. Now on to the mission of tasting our soup. And welcome to our special feature. Today, we will be discussing three facts about breast cancer, seeing that it is October. So let us begin. Firstly, mammograms save lives. Mammograms are proven to reduce the rate of death from breast cancer. The Breast Center recommends annual screening mammograms for women starting at age 40. Secondly, family history increases your risk. A woman's risk for developing breast cancer almost doubles if her mother, sister, or daughter has breast cancer. Lastly, there are more than 3 million breast cancer survivors in the United States. Early detection is key as it greatly increases cancer survival rates. With early detection, the 5-year survival rate for breast cancer is nearly 100%. Anyway, PowerPointers, I hope you learned a little bit more about breast cancer. And if there's anyone you know who is going through it right now, remind them that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. Until next time, stay safe and blessed, and I'll see you all next week. Bye!